Hey everybody, welcome to Yeah. Uh, yet again for a lovely Christmas special. Today I've got a very special guest for you all. His name is Jesus. And he knows a lot about ecclesiastical Latin, its history, and its varieties today. So, without further ado, let's get jolly. All right, everybody, here we are. This is my good friend from college, Jesus. Jesus, I'm his good friend. That, that's right, that's right. Why don't, why don't you tell everyone of the nubscribers a little bit about yourself, Jesus? Um, I am a student at, do they know what university you're from? Yeah, yeah, they know. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm also a student at ASU. I am working on a bachelor's degree in linguistics and a certificate in TESOL. Um, I met your host last year, I believe. Yeah, it was sometime in 2019. Yeah, yeah. I think it was last fall. Yeah, just about, somewhere just about a year ago. Mm, pretty much. Yeah, I am a cantor. I've been singing Gregorian chant for maybe four years now. I've never actually studied Latin grammar thoroughly, you know, picking up a textbook and reading it. But mm -hmm. because of my exposure to it and, and the similarities it has to all the other romance languages, you just, you just kind of pick it up. Very nice. All right, so... You, you know a lot about ecclesiastical Latin, therefore, from your time as a cantor, and you've studied the history of it. And so that's what we're here to talk about today, the history and development and the varieties of ecclesiastical Latin as they have come into existence over the many years since the Roman Empire went bye-bye. So, you know, so how, Jesus, how did ecclesiastical Latin come into existence? Well, um, I would start by dismissing this idea that there is an ecclesiastical Latin. Many people will use this term, you know, you, you learn that there is classical Latin and there's ecclesiastical Latin. Mm -hmm. But really we should be talking about ecclesiastical Latins. Yeah. Because there is much variety in there, in both mm -hmm. the time and place that we're talking about. What, what happens is a phenomenon that happens to sacred languages all over the world. It's that the language and its texts get fixed in one period of time, and the language keeps developing, and the people move on, and they develop new languages, or they pick up new languages from outsiders. And their phonology, uh, sometimes their grammar, if they're still composing things, uh, continues to change along with the spoken languages of the population yeah and so what happens is as the as the spanish speakers start turning their start turning their cares into this <laughs> their latin also changes they no longer say caelum but thelum. they and the french don't say thelum because they're not spanish they say selon you know and so in all of these different parts of europe where latin is used daily the pronunciation changes with with all the same phonological phonological changes that happen to the local languages and we develop all these different varieties of pronunciations and these are the ecclesiastical pronunciations so the, the most common one of these that exists today would be the Italian pronunciations, right? But of course, you know, that's not the only one. You've told me there's the German variety. There's the weird, like, alternative French variety that exists. There was, like, the yeah. English variety that existed for a long time. And a lot of, you know, various controversies happened over the course of all these variations over which one was the correct one. Really, where, where, did, where did the first you know, real decision as to which of these was supposed to be, you know, in several sets of quotation marks, like the correct one. When did people start debating this with each other? How did this happen? This really all starts with Erasmus back in the 1500s. Erasmus was a scholar of ancient languages, Greek and Latin, of course, mm -hmm. the, the classics, you yeah. know. <laughs> um, and he starts to realize, I believe it was in Greek first, he was like, that doesn't rhyme. 
you know, it's like he's reading this poetry and it just doesn't make sense. He's musing on how he knows people from different countries who pronounce these languages differently. And he starts to form a picture of, well, somebody must be wrong, you know? And mm-hmm. he and he just starts trying to backtrack and he tries reading, um, I believe, Plato's uh, explanation of different sounds in the Greek language. And he makes a sort of reconstruction of both Greek and Latin pronunciations. They were not the best cupcake in the oven, right? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, they tried, <laughs> but but he got he got pretty close. Yeah, you know, yeah. in, in in the grand scheme of things, he got pretty close. Yeah, and more importantly, he got people thinking about this. Mm. Unfortunately, people really didn't follow along. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what kind of pronunciation you use. It's Latin, and we all understand it. Yeah, because you know, like but, everyone was using like their own personal, like like their regions, like pronunciation, their own phonologies to exactly, yeah, exactly. So they didn't it, care. <laughs> exactly, like you and I can read Shakespeare. Yeah. We can we can read old stuff. Um, Chaucer, Chaucer, <laughs> yeah, Cranmer. We can bit. read. We can read those. Yeah. in a modern accent just fine and it makes sense yeah like spelling aside that doesn't matter the point is it doesn't really need it matter what phonology you're using as long as you understand it mm-hmm. which i will say to all you language learners don't be afraid of pronouncing something wrong because you're gonna do it anyways yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you stress yourself out too much on like trying to make a phoneme that you know <laughs> that just can't happen Mm -hmm. you know a lot of the time that that equivalent will be similar enough that you'll still be able to get by fine without causing any confusion exactly and that's how latin did do for a long time (laughs) that's how latin it that's how yeah exactly (laughs) that's how it went along now what happened the really bad thing that happened was english (laughs) because we had the great vowel shift and as hideous as that sounds <laughs> the english were pronouncing latin through the great vowel shift mm-hmm. you know so all the long vowels uh, all changed yep <laughs> pater nostra quies in sila sank of the cedar nomen tuum fiat valenza sua sigurd in sila et in terra painum nostrum quotidianum de novus audia de met de novus de nostra sigurd in nostrum et in nostris et nem in symbolicus tendacianum so Liberian is the of Maine. Ooh. Oh, God. Amen. Not a- 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 Amen. <laughs> Amen. So oh, Liberian is the of Maine. You know. Oh, that hurts. It hurts. It, this, this is how Latin was pronounced. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, we, we do know that they did know how to pronounce the vowels correctly. I forget who this author was, but they were talking about this certain account where a Polish official, government official, came to England and they were looking for directions and they didn't have a single English translator with them. I don't know why, but they didn't (laughs) have a translator. Smart gamer moves right there. (laughs) And they're looking around and there is a, you know, they find some educated rich guy and they ask him for directions in latin and he speaks back to them uh in in latin and they they figure out how to get to the palace or wherever it was they were going Mm -hmm. this implies that they could understand the englishman yeah but we have other accounts that say from from people in the continent that when English speakers spoke Latin, they thought it was English. Meaning that the English both used this obscure, like, British Isles pronunciation, (laughs) as well as the continental pronunciation of the vowels. They were familiar enough with them that they could switch with relative ease. Mm-hmm. But they the, chose to use the English one anyway. <laughs> they chose to use the English one when speaking with Englishmen because yeah. that's that's simply how you learn Latin. Mm-hmm. That that's how it goes. You know that they, they were they were being 
descriptivists back then, you know? <laughs> they, they, yeah. they, 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 they weren't right. falling for that prescriptivist illusion. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> sure, surely they thought they were the correct ones. But yeah, yeah, they definitely were. <laughs> they weren't thinking it in, in, in like a, in an open-minded perspective, for sure. No. <laughs> right. Now what happens is in the 1800s, well, um, in the 1500s, during, you know, Erasmus's time, King Henry VIII splits from the Catholic Church and mm. they form the Church of England, the Anglican yeah. Church, which, unsurprisingly, uses English as its liturgical language. They're obviously still studying many Latin texts. It's a very important part of education and their culture, but they're not using it as much. And so mm. it, it, it doesn't take as much space. And, and because they're no longer part of the Catholic Church, they are, you know, England is just kind of apart from the rest of the world now. Yeah. So what happens is in the 1800s, two things happen. So number one thing is that Catholicism is once again legal in England. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is good for us Catholics, <laughs> but better for Latin. The other thing is that in Oxford, there are a lot of scholars who are realizing that the way they pronounce Latin is dumb and they want to go back. <laughs> and so they're all studying the, um, the older pronunciation. Uh, they're all trying to reconstruct it. Yeah. Meanwhile, also in Oxford happens <laughs> the Oxford movement wherein many Anglicans want to go back to that medieval church life. You know, they start wearing brocade vestments and they they start doing things more ritually and they start using Latin. And when Catholicism is, is restored, well, now they are, they have to adopt a Catholic rite. And the rite is like the, all the ritual books of how you're, how you're going to do everything, you know? Yeah. And all the Catholic, all the Western rites are in Latin. And they end up using the Roman rite, which is that which is used in Italy and most of Europe, instead of going back to some ancient English rite, the Sarum or the York rites. Uh -huh which do exist and they're awesome, but unfortunately <laughs> they didn't come back in a full sense. Damn. I know. <laughs> now that they have adopted the Roman rite, they don't want to use the English pronunciation anymore. And so they adopt yeah. the Roman pronunciation of Latin. The situation now in the 1800s, England, is that there are three pronunciations of, of Latin running around. You have all the old guys, Mm -hmm. the old schools, textbooks, all that. We were using the traditional English pronunciation <laughs> of Latin. Meanwhile, in Oxford, you have both this reconstructed Wenny Weedy Weeki mm -hmm. and this Italian <laughs> Veni Vidi Vici. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, the reconstructed classical pronunciation wins over in academia, and the Italian pronunciation wins over in choirs and churches. And the English version go, goes bye-bye. It just bye kind bye. of dies off. <laughs> it just kind of dies off. Yeah. The, I believe the last school, I believe it was really last top around World War I, and that's kind of when it just like, it, it's dead now. Now, something else happens in the late 1800s. The restoration of Gregorian chant. Remember how I said I'm a cantor? I yeah. sing Gregorian chant. Mm -hmm. Gregorian chant is ancient. Oh, yeah. Some of the chants probably go back to the second temple, like pre-Jesus. Jeez. You know? <laughs> but Gregorian chant is not entirely a continuously living tradition. Back to the 1500s. Everything happened in the 1500s and the 1800s. <laughs> Back to the 1500s, you have all of these Renaissance and Baroque artists who are composing new music. They're composing polyphony. And that kind of throws Gregorian chant into the wayside. You know? Variants of the Gregorian chant survive in in different groups. There's the monastery of Dom Guéranger founded the monastery of Salem. It is a Benedictine monastery and 
His goal really was to restore the Roman Rite, including especially its chant. He and his successors do fantastic work in that area. We eventually get to André Mokoro. Mm-hmm. André Mokoro is a genius. He goes to all these monasteries, seeing all these manuscripts, and he copies these chants by hand. He comes up with this idea of how we're supposed to be sung, and he publishes these called a gradual. Gradual has all the chants for the mass of the entire year, and he publishes these. And and the Pope at that point, I forget who it was, he sends a letter to him. He kind of says like, hey, that, that book that you're writing, yeah, that's that's fantastic work. Keep it up. You, know? <laughs> you can't do that. Please just give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he's eventually put in this committee to like to get a bunch of people to really work on this and publish the the only like the first official book with all the chants for the whole year. <laughs> and they they eventually get they eventually get the Editio Vatican published. Now, the Editio Vaticana has a, one of the things that they had to standardize for it was the pronunciation of Latin. And uh-huh. they chose to use the Roman pronunciation of Latin. They were Frenchmen, yes. I'm sure they didn't <laughs> want to, but they thought it was prudent to use <laughs> the Roman pronunciation. From that point on, the Roman pronunciation becomes the official pronunciation of Latin for the entire Western Church. There we this, go. This is now the official, but also the very pronunciation of Latin. And the Editio Vaticana itself, in the preface which describes this, states how, yes, we are aware that this is not how Latin used to be pronounced. We are also aware that we don't know exactly how Latin was pronounced. But more importantly, we don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, ul- the ultimate, the <laughs> ultimate trap card right there. Like. <laughs> because, because at the end of the day, the point of making this standardized book was not to go back to something. It was to have something authentic, something real. And all of these local pronunciations of Latin are authentic and yeah. real but reconstructed line isn't yeah it, it's not a living tradition it, it's the only one that was you know forced into existence <laughs> exactly exactly and it may well by this point in time it may well be extremely accurate but it's not alive yeah like like that's not the point it's like <laughs> you know at, at this point the reconstructed latin is you know, it, it, it's more of like a conlang than anything. <laughs> right. In some ways, yeah. it's like a conlang. Got to gotta, gotta make that that connection. To <laughs> there yes. Go. Some yes. might call it a conlang. <laughs> Vsauce music <laughs> plays. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is like a conlang. It is. The Italian pronunciation is the official pronunciation of the Latin church. Well, I mean, just what do you think? If if some big guy in Italy, you use Latin every day, right? And some big guy in Italy tells you, uh, oh, to, for all official functions, you're now using the Italian pronunciation of Latin. And we're going to pretend you're not like an Italian. You don't know any Italian. How well is that going to go? Okay. Bureaucracy said that. I... No. <laughs> What's Italian sound like again? <laughs> right. Now, the... The English had been using it already. Yeah. They were fine with it. The yeah, French, they much. eventually get the hang of the whole Italian stuff, but they kind of meander a bit. But there's one group that never, never picked up the Italian. That was the Germans. Yep, the Germans. <laughs> the Germans. Germans and some of the other Eastern European countries, they kept using the German and Eastern European pronunciations of Latin. They don't say agimus, they say agimus. They so don't say agnus, they say agnus. And they, and they don't say qui, it's qui. Qui a her It's very German, very powerful. But more importantly than their own opinions, was their culture because the church wasn't the only group using Latin every day. 
in Germany. Germany has a this great opera tradition. Yeah. You know, and they have a they have a theater pronunciation of German that is just like uh, classical Latin. It's constructed. Yeah. <laughs> they have a constructed pronunciation of their own home language. Of made course, they're going to have. Yep. A strict pronunciation of Latin. Mm -hmm. And it survives and acquires. Many choirs and orchestras in Germany still use the German pronunciation, have no reason to switch to Italian. It's still used in the stage. And so, of course, the priests and monks and everybody else in among the clergy are going to keep using the German pronunciation, perhaps out of resistance because they don't want to be Italian, but <laughs> more so, especially now I've spoken to people who use it, it seems to be more so simply because that's what they're familiar with, that's what they know, and that's what they teach. And so now you you really have two pronunciations of Latin you know, among ecclesiastical Latin, right? Yeah. You have the Italian and I, I suppose the Eastern European pronunciations, which yeah. is there's a little variance between them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you can more or less group them together, but there is some very variation from country to country. Yeah. And then we're going to fast forward to today, to the 200, 2000s. <laughs> the 200s, yeah. The 200. <laughs> There's a lot of these, you know, Renaissance, you know, you have the Renaissance Fair, yeah. you know, you have all these medieval things coming up. And mm -hmm. a lot of people get really interested in doing things the way they used to be done not not to like live it you know but to like perform it you know it, it's it's kind of artistic it's kind of a way to express yourself yeah and along with that there is actually a lot of interest among choirs to to sing old french compositions the way they were originally intended uh -oh. because the french pronunciation of latin is very different they rediscover this old French pronunciation of Latin. Beautiful. The Baroque hmm. French pronunciation of Latin is absolutely my favorite of all the Latins. Baroque French pronunciation. Baroque French Latin. That that sounds just sexy. <laughs> it, it is. It really is. Aveveron corpus netom de Maria Virginia. Repassom in molatom in crucepron, cujus datus pervoratom fluxitaguesa. Estopu. Evo stonovis pregustato mortis in exam. O Jesu dulcis, O Jesu pie, O Jesu pie, Maria. Now that is. <laughs> that is just delicious. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's no wonder that these French choirs want to use it. As far as I know, it has not been adopted back by any church groups. I don't know of any I don't know of any scola that uses the French the old French pronunciation. Uh-huh. That would be great. So, you know, that that that's that's kind of really where we're at now. Yeah, so we have majority of church services are using the Italian, Italian pronunciation mm -hmm. of Which Latin. is what everybody knows is ecclesiastical. Yeah, yeah, you know, V in quotation marks, mm -hmm. ecclesiastical Latin mm -hmm. that everyone knows about. <laughs> right. Sev several sets of quotation marks. <laughs> but, <Yes>. meanwhile, <laughs> but meanwhile, you also have the German slash Eastern German and um, Eastern European in general mm -hmm. format. And then mm -hmm. now there's the fledgling, mostly choral, delicious French version. And right. rest in peace to the English version. Rest in peace. <laughs> rest, yes. in peace. <laughs> rest in peace. Rest in peace. And, and, and you have, well, so the French is relegated mostly to secular choirs. And then you also have, of course, the reconstructed which is used oh, yeah. by universities, academia. Mm -hmm. you know. no, that, that's the Duolingo Latin you get. That's the Duolingo. <laughs> we. <laughs> you, you use it. Everybody talks about Latin as though it's a dead language. Mm -hmm. But it isn't. It isn't a dead language. Uh, not for us. Yeah. For us, it's very much a living language. We 
use it every day. We we use it for the literally the hours, which for priests and monks, you know, that's seven or depending on what books you're using, eight times a day. For the mass, we use it for our processions, parades, uh, for other extra liturgical stuff, just just random prayers. We use it all the time. For us, it's very much a living tradition. It's not something that we talk about as though it was happened 2,000 years ago. It's something that happens to us now. You know, yeah. our, our faith and our tradition is very much a now, here and now, in a very physical sense. And That's Latin, right. Latin for us is alive. I can, I can go to Germany. I can go to Singapore, Australia. I guess Australia speaks English. Um, <laughs> you know, I can go to Singapore and go to a Latin mass and know exactly where I am and what's going on. Yeah, and you're, you're, you're proof of it's continuing to exist. You, you are an example. <laughs> yep. it, 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 it's something alive. It's yeah. something alive. Right? I, can't, I can't get past that. I have to make sure all of your viewers, yeah. myself included among them, <laughs> Take this from them, that Latin is a lie, that is not a dead language. And we shouldn't treat it as though it is. Exactly. That is 100% true. The reconstructed one is a conlang. <laughs> this. Which I love. <laughs> exactly. It's it's cool. It's cool. Right. But, you know, there there's examples. There's countless examples, including Jesus here, who speaks. Oh. <laughs> who speaks at least one form of living Latin. <laughs> at least a little bit of all the other varieties too, apparently. <laughs> I know of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know I know people who use them. Yeah. And I mean that's all it really takes. Like you you've you've got that connection going. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, th I think we I think we've gotten a good amount of content in here <laughs> over the past hour. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, hopefully we don't see any. I don't know something wrong with the video. Yeah, that, did you that hit would record. Be, I did hit record. I still see the little recording yeah, I see a thing. Little button. Yeah, Is it frozen? Is it for frozen for you? No, it's it's still pulsing for me. So we're good. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I, I would freak out. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, come on. you want to. Give, give us a good old Latin Latin goodbye and Merry Christmas. <laughs> a Latin goodbye and Merry Christmas. Mi ti piace molto. Rocky Bobby's come. Not non Bobby's come. Said Ad Bobby's. Um said um mi ti piace. Uh, Esti cum ti ad masva in anima. Ecco non si va. Said um in in colloquium tu in tu tuglo. Eh, Ego volo vobis omnes dicere Felix dies natalis domini nostri Jesu Christi et Dominus noster uh, benedicat vos in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Beautiful. All right. Well, there we go. There you Alete have it. Et alete. That's right. That's right. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>